Dr. Rosales. Uh, he is lecturer at the Imaging Center at uh, King's College uh, in London, at um, Lambeth Wing St. Thomas Hospital in London. And he's talking about PET imaging allows accurate whole body detection and quantification of liposomal nanomedicines in tumors and metastatic, in metastatic uh, origins. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So thank you for the for the introduction and um, okay, I got this. So the motivation of this work is that we want to track nanomedicines using PET, so po uh, positron emission tom tomography. And the reason we want to do this is because we generally believe that imaging nano nanomedicine accumulation at target sites is predictive of efficacy. And uh, there are now, at least for liposomes, two independent studies that have demonstrated that. So there are clear applications in, in terms of patient stratification, and I generally believe that we can improve the clinical efficacy of nanomedicines by doing this. Um, so why did we choose PET as the imaging technology? Uh, the main reason is because PET is incredibly sensitive. We can uh, radio label very small quantities and we can inject very small quantities of, a, of, a, of an image of a nanomedicine enough to get an imaging signal, so this is what we call microdosing, which is generally 1% of the therapeutic dose. It's a hotspot technique, so there's no background from the body. We don't have any tissue penetration issues, um, which is something that uh, is particularly problematic with the ultrasound. We can do whole body imaging, we can do dynamic scanning and, and follow the kinetics of the, of the nanomedicine, and most importantly, it's quantifiable. And we can get accurate quantification from this, unlike with uh, clinical SPECT. So some people ask, why do you go for PET and no SPECT? And I always show them this image uh, here, which is a uh, two patient, well, there's one patient uh, with a neuroendocrine tumor that has been imaged with the same targeting peptide, labeled with a PET isotope and a SPECT isotope. And I think it's very clear, uh, and the image speaks for itself, the many uh, soft tissue and, and bone metastasis that you cannot see with PET. That you, with spec, sorry, that you can see with PET. So incredibly sensitive, and in terms of special resolution, much better. So this is why we chose PET. Okay, so the same issues as the previous speakers. Yeah, I'm pressing. Okay, now I need to go back, probably. So the aim uh, of this study, and as an imaging chemist, was to develop a simple and efficient and GMP-compatible method to radio-level preform liposomal nanomedicines. And we wanted to do this with using clinically relevant methods and materials, so we chose to, to study stealth liposomes because these are the ones that have been introduced in the clinic, and also PET radionuclides that have a radionuclide half-life that matches the biological half-life of stealth liposomes. Uh, in our case, it will be Ciconium 89, which is a, has a half-life of 3.2 days. Nice gap. What is it with this? <laughs> okay, so many people have been labeling liposomes uh, for many years. Uh, you've seen already yesterday the studies from Kevin Harrington in human patients. Um, but may, very few people have radio labeled li liposomes with PET isotopes. And when we did the literature review on, on this, what we found is that most of the techniques available uh, relied on the, the introduction of exogenous uh, chelators or binding, metal binding, radionuclide binding uh, sites either in the liposome uh, membrane or in, inside the liposome. Uh, some of them relied on the affinity of some of these isotopes to the, to the phospholipid membrane, which is not stable. And what we thought is, uh, what, what about the contents of the liposome? What about the drug itself? Um, it's present in a really high concentration, and many of these drugs do indeed contain metal binding groups. Okay, so, so this is just an example of a few of the nanomedicines, of, of the drugs of interest in nanomedicine. And just to, to give you an example, for instance, amino isosonates bind very well to metals. Um, anthracyclines, such as doxorubicin or donorubicin, they all contain uh, metal binding sites. Even corticosteroids contain metal binding sites. And I think that even nucleic acids will be uh, very good at metal, uh, binding metals. So, the, 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 I think the strategy was clear, and the hypothesis was that if the uh, liposomal nanomedicine... So what's the trick with this? Previous speakers, maybe help me. Okay. Um, 
So the hypothesis was that if the encapsulated drug contains uh, metal binding properties or has metal binding properties, then we should be able to ready label preformed uh, liposomal nanomedicines with high efficiency in terms of um, labeling yields and specific activity, and also should lead to high in vitro and in vivo stability because the radio label will be inside bound to the drug itself. So to do this, the radio nucleides, usually radio metals, are not able to cross a lipid membrane, so we need to use an ionophore. And for those of you who don't know, an ionophore, brilliant, thank you. Um, an ionophore is, is a molecule that transports uh, metal ions or ions in general through lipid bilayers. And uh, we decided to, uh, to use, and it was a conscious decision to use hydroxyquinoline ionophores. And the reason for this is because the, the, they have been used for many, many years to label white blood cells in, in, radio in, in radio pharmacies. So it's clinically approved and there's a lot of experience with it. And we developed three, well, two of them were already de developed, one of them we developed ourselves, uh, three radio metal ionophore complexes. And I guess to test the method, the, 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 the best test was to do a head-to-head head -head comparison between radio labeling an empty liposome and a, and a liposome that is full of drug. And it was very nice to see that when we incubated our liposomes with our metal ionophore complexes, uh, uh, with a liposome that contains drugs, sorry, we got very efficient radio labeling. Whenever the liposome was empty, we didn't get any radio labeling. So I think that is a, a final proof, definitive proof that it is binding what is binding, and the, the method works. So in terms of uh, efficiency, we studied three different radio metals, zirconium-89, manganese-52, and copper-64, and using different liposomal drugs, uh, containing different drugs, mainly alendronate, a combination of alendronate with doxorubicin, alendronate that contains sodium instead of ammonium as a contraion, and doxorubicin. And what we see in general is really high radio labeling yields, and very nicely, uh, oops, uh, the, the labeling is concentration, metal, and drug dependent, as you would expect, uh, if, you, if you look at the basic coordination chemistry principles. And uh, in zirconium, the case of zirconium, uh, high radio labeling yields were, were seen pretty much with all of the liposomes, really high specific activities, which means that we can do microdosing. So that means that we can radio label sub-therapeutic uh, amounts of the drug uh, for patient use. And very nicely as well that we, we didn't see any changes in the physical chemical properties of these liposomes. In terms of uh, in vitro stability, so we incubated them in serum for three days at 37 degrees, and most of them will be in the range of, uh, eight, oh, okay, um, of 85 to 100 uh, uh, percent intact after three days. In the worst case scenario, it's 80 percent intact after three days. But if you take into account what is the, the biological half-life of these nanomedicines, um, I think these uh, this, uh, stabilities are excellent. So we moved on into a, a preclinical study, uh, and we chose to, to go for uh, alendronate, which is an amino bisosonate. The main reason for this is because it's a highly cytotoxic drug uh, that benefits from the nanomedicine treatment, and it's also it's a very good sensitizer for gamma delta T cell immunotherapies. And we, as, a, as an isotope, we decided to go for zirconium 89. Um, in terms of the animal model, we decided to go for this uh, metastatic breast cancer model. Uh, it's an interesting model because it contains uh, a, a reported gene, HNIS, the human sodium iodide importer, that we can track in vivo using pertechnetate. And that HNIS reported gene is also fused with uh, GFP and RFP so that we can do fluorescent imaging. So this is a picture of, of one of the mice, and that's a primary tumor. You can see it's fluorescent. Uh, we also get very, very uh, consistent metastasis in the lungs and the lymph nodes. Um, in the animal, when we inject pertechnetate, what we see we see uh, the stomach and the thyroid, and these are the two organs that uh, endogenously express HNIS. And we also see the primary tumor, as you would expect, the metastasis on the lungs and the metata metastasis in the lymph nodes. So when you inject uh, our radio label PLA, alendronate, uh, pegylated alendronate, uh, liposomal alendronate, um, into these mice, what you see is what you expect in uh, for a stealth liposome. Um, soon after the injection, it's all blood pool. One day after, you still have uh, loads in the blood pool. You start to see some accumulation in the liver and the spleen, as you would expect. And some of the tumor, three days after injection, you see uh, quite significant accumulation in the tumor, as you would expect, spleen and liver. Um, you notice that the, most of the liposome accumulated in, in, at the rim of the tumor. And uh, if you look at the spec images, so this is when we are looking at the cancer cells, we can actually confirm that the liposome is accumulated in, mostly in the viable side of the tumor. 
So if we look at, uh, if we look at uh, more detail into the tumor, what we see is that the uptake in, in the tumor is highly heterogeneous within the viable uh, section of the tumor, and it's consistent with different levels of vascularization uh, due to the EPR effect, as we proved by histology. Um, it was very nice to see when we did the ex vivo analysis, we saw some of the metastatic lymph nodes had very high uptake of the, of the liposomal nanomedicine. So we went back to the, to the images, and uh, we indeed uh, found that m m in many of these lymph nodes, there was a high uptake of, of the nanomedicine, and that was confirmed that it was metastatic using HNIS. And we didn't see that high uptake in non-metastatic lymph nodes from the same mouse and from different controls. And again, doing histology, we proved, I think, that the reason for this is because these lymph nodes are half more microvessel density. Um, so what about, so I showed you that it works with a liposomal alendron, with alendronate and, and with doxorubicin. What about other liposomes? So soon after publishing this uh, paper in, in November, uh, Professor uh, Banningholz contacted me uh, because he thought that his liposomes containing uh, this glucocorticosteroid will be amenable for radio labeling. So this group here, um, is able to bind zirconium. So we did a test, a very quick pilot study, uh, to confirm that we can actually do image this, this, this liposome. So what you see again is a standard by distribution at one hour after injection and one day after ejection of a stealth liposome with most of it circulation in the bloodstream and accumulation in the liver and spleen. So we're hoping to do a, an inflammation model soon. Um, so as conclusions, um, I think we've developed quite an efficient method to radio label preformed li liposomal nanomedicines with metallic PEST isotopes. We've used a multimodal and multi scale imaging strategy to show that PET can be used to locate um, and quantify liposomal drug uptake, not just in tumors, but also in metast and metastatic tissues. Our method, we believe, is clinically and GMP compatible. We, use, uh, uh, we don't modify the liposome in any way. We use clinically, uh, use inophores and we can do microdosing. So we hope that this method, this method will, in the future, support uh, clinical trials in this area, and also to allow patient certification, with the final aim, of course, to, to, to be able to improve the treatment of, uh, with liposomal nanomedicines. So with this, I'd like to uh, finish by saying thank you to, to my group and the students that did the work, uh, collaborations with uh, Gilbert Fru, with uh, and Alessia Volpe, Volpe in particular, who did the uh, preclinical study, my collaborators in Israel who provided me with, uh, with uh, the liposomes, uh, Alberto Gabison and, and Hesse Barenholz, and the Heavy Sea Lab in, in Denmark who provided me with the exotic isotopes such as manganese 52, and CRUK and EPSRC for funding. And obviously, think, thank you for your attention. So, thank you very much for the talk, Professor Barenholz. Definitely nice work, you know, I'm a small part of it, so I no, but it is beautiful. I think it's very powerful techniques, and I think you should push it as fast as possible to the clinical use, overcome all the regulatory stuff, and I think mm -hmm. it can be very, very helpful. But regarding the ionophore, how specific they are to the different ions, or they are not that specific at all? They're Let's say <laughs> if I take zinc, for example. So it depends on the metal. So the, uh, oxin, hydroxyquinolines are very good metal chelators. They've been used for ages to extract metals from, from uh, industrial waste, etc. So they're not very specific. However, the, the complex that you form uh, will be different. So some metal ions will be bigger than others. So, so the number of oxin ions will be different, but they're not that specific. Um, so you have a, a nitrogen and an oxygen. So there's both. I mean, I'm not going to get into the chemistry. They're not specific. <laughs> you use for the zirconium? Um, not for copper. We actually use a, a small uh, an isomer, which is 2-hydroxyquinoline, which okay. was shown by Thomas Anderson that was, was slightly better for copper than, than okay. oxygen. So that's the reason we went for that. But you could use equally 8-hydroxyquinoline. Okay, thank you. There was one, only one question. Sorry about, because we are a little bit running out of time. You were first. Okay. You showed it took three days to get uh, uh, targeting to the tumor, yeah. but it looked like it had cleared from, from the blood before that three days. Was there then a uh, migration of active species to the tumor, or what is happening? So, so uh, sorry, I, I don't think I understand very well the question. Um, 
so what we see here is, is basically, so what do you mean that the, the, by day three has cleared from the tumor, for, from the circulation? Yeah, it looked like most of it had cleared from circulation. Yeah. So is there actually a, a movement from the liver to the, the tumor? Uh, no, yeah, I think it's gradual. So I haven't shown this because I didn't have time. But um, let me show this. We can obviously do time activity curves and look at the kinetics, etc. Uh, let me see. I should have it here. There you go. So what, what happens is uh, in, increases over time in the liver and the spleen, the excretion pathway, and it also increases in the tumor. This is after day seven. I think after day seven, probably starts to decrease. So I, I don't think this migration within the, the organs is basically accumulation from the tumor uptake is directly related to that that is circulating. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. I'll, we can discuss it later. Yeah. I think we could. The other question, maybe we have time after after the. the yeah, now I would like to announce the last speaker.